Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Uh, today we have with us Zach Rosen. Zach is a man with a uh, remarkable recent history in online activism. Uh, I believe Zach uh, takes all credit and no blame for the remarkable meteoric rise and, well, well, you know what happens to meteors, uh, of the Dean campaign, which uh, really put a spotlight on the role of computer-mediated collective action. Uh, at least that's the way I like to think of it. So uh, here today, Zach will talk a bit about his recent work and ongoing projects, and I hope you will welcome him along with me. So thank you, Zach. Hello. Welcome thanks. to MSR. So um, thanks. Um, I'm going to start with a, a story, and then uh, I'll talk a bit about what, uh, about the Dean campaign and what I do at Civic Space and kind of give you that spiel. Um, okay, so uh, that's the wrong button. Uh -huh. There we go. Okay, so on August 29th, 2005, Hurricane Katrina uh, hit, hit land. Uh, and I was in my office, <coughs> excuse me, at Civic Space, um, sitting there kind of dumbfounded uh, and wondering what to do and reading the news uh, on, on BBC because that for some strange reason, had, had the best uh, coverage. Uh, and also reading a lot of blogs and uh, looking at the incoming Flickr feeds uh, that were tagged Katrina, which were um, actually really interesting. Uh, and I mean, it became really apparent that this thing was pretty crazy. It was, it was I mean, I, I certainly had never seen anything like it. And it seemed like the newscasters on TV had never seen anything like it. Um, and the people. Uh, who were um, supposed to be calling the shots seemed as surprised as everyone else. And I, like many other people, uh, started asking myself, what, you know, what can I do? Uh, you know, what can I do from, from where I am or what can I do, period? Uh, and you know, obviously, there's a, uh, donating blood and donating money to the American Red Cross and the United Way, and there's lots of great groups who are doing tremendous work. But um, uh, you know, I, I really... Um, it really seemed that things were coming apart in a lot of ways, and that well, I you know I definitely I did donate my 50 bucks to the Red Cross. Um, it it uh, it seemed like uh, the the aid or the the help wasn't getting to necessarily where it needed to go. Uh, and you had you know you had instances where the guy on the ground in in the um, in in New Orleans, you know Ralph Nagin, the, the mayor of New Orleans, is yelling up at the feds saying, <laughs> "You you guys are screwing this all up." Uh, and this, you know, this, from, from the outside, uh, it, really, it really seemed like, uh, uh, hopefully, that there was more that we could do. Um, and so I, I, you know, I don't know how you guys work, but, but when I, you know, kind of get an idea in my head, I just start Googling a lot and clicking around a lot. And I ended up on this website, uh, NOLA.com, which was, I don't know if any of you have ever seen it, but it's basically, it was the de facto uh, web news source for residents in, in New Orleans. Uh, as as the hurricane was uh, hap uh, happening and as the aftermath unfolded, uh, and they had this uh, message form set up on their site, which people were using for many many different reasons. Uh, but but uh, one of the most interesting things that was happening were people were using it actually as a as a a way of telling about uh, their status, right? So uh, people would, there's there's one message form for missing persons. So people would come here and post a message like, "Have you seen?" Well, here from Faye Ann Alliston. Faye Ann and her husband Woody live in Bay, uh, Bay Street, St. Louis. They have family in Louisiana, Florida. Please tell them to contact Aunt Rita in Panama City. Let me know if you're here for them. Thank you and God bless. And literally, you know, you can see there's, there's many hundreds of these such messages on this page. Um, and, uh, and then there was another, a completely other forum for people, you know, talking about uh, their status. So people who were okay would come to the I'm okay forum and post a message. So here's one from Susan Bannister. To Gerald uh, Turan, uh, Turan, Susan wants, you, wants to let you know she's okay. I'm her cousin Tony, and I'm checking here daily. If you or anyone knows Gerald re, uh, reads this, please call and he gives his phone number, uh, and, and I'll, I'll get uh, in contact with you. 
Uh, and I mean, you can see how many threads there are. There's literally thousands and thousands. I mean, just like kind of, if you refresh the page, you just scroll past um, uh, as, as you watch. Message posts about people trying to find people and people talking about uh, where they were. Uh, and it wasn't just happening on, on NOLA.com. There was uh, people using Craigslist as a de facto uh, people searching utility. Uh, and uh, people started setting up uh, databases, basically structured data sets where people could enter in the first name and the last name and their zip code and their, their status. And, and you could do um, uh, searching uh, on the records. And you know, these literally every couple hours, someone would kind of take it upon themselves to set up another site. Uh, and this is a real problem because uh, none of these sites actually share data with one another. And so they're all based essentially different data sources. And so anyone who, who is posting a message on NOLA or is posting a message on, on Craigslist, uh, if someone was searching you know, this directory, they wouldn't necessarily find that record. Uh, and, uh, uh, and eventually, we, we counted over 40 of these, these different data sources. Uh, and this is a, a, this is a real problem. You know, I thought that, that uh, uh, immediately this seemed to be like a, a, a big problem. Uh, and I talked with a few of the friends, and they seemed to think that this was a problem. Um, and my friend David Gilf, uh, about the time uh, I'm sitting at my office, IMs me and says, uh, uh, hey, uh, and, and says basically what I was thinking. So these Katrina uh, uh, survivor databases are getting out of control. And I said, yeah, tell me about it. Uh, I mean, there must be like 30 of them out there, right? Uh, I know, and none of them are sharing any data, and this is a real nightmare. And he said, well, someone should do something about this. And I said, like what? Create a standard of data interchange, merge the data, and make it web searchable? And he said, sure. That's exactly what we should do. Let's do it. Uh, and my response immediately was, well, that seems like a ton of work. Isn't that uh, the job for the government or something? Uh, you know, <laughs> right, let's go do this. Uh, OK, so here's a checklist for undertaking a massive data management manipulation task as an ad hoc network of decentralized volunteers. The first thing I recommend is a wiki. Uh, we didn't actually set up our own wiki. We, we used a, a borrowed wiki that someone had set up as basically a, a, a resource for uh, uh, anyone involved uh, uh, in, in the hurricane. We just basically created our own wiki page on, on here for organizing this effort. We created, uh, in the end, six mailing lists. Uh, we only started with one. But basically, people, people could sign up and, and, and um, send messages to one another and, and organize the work that they were doing. And uh, at, at the peak of this effort, I mean, I was getting three or four messages every, every five, five, ten minutes. It was you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of messages. Um, and uh, a posse of adept technical volunteers. Uh, so I posted a message on Joy Ito's web blog um, uh, advertising that, that we were um, taking upon ourselves to solve this problem. And I, and I, I posted the same message in, in Joy Ito's chat room. And within a couple hours, I had about 10 people signed up. And we ended up with, with 30 technical volunteers in the end, actually over, over 30, uh, including uh, one Berkeley PhD student named Ping who's capable of solving any technical task if motivated. I've worked with Ping uh, a couple, I've had the, the, the great fortune to work with Ping a couple times in the, in the past. He's truly tremendous. Uh, and his, this is him uh, checking in. Uh, and uh, a properly coordinated legion of data entry volunteers. Now, now you notice some of, some of those data records were um, uh, structured, but most of them, well, many of them were unstructured data sources, literally message board posts. And so uh, John Lebowski uh, posted a message and got, got on Boing Boing, basically advertising the fact that we were, we were organizing a bunch of data entry volunteers to go in and hand enter all those unstructured data sources in, into our database. Uh, and we had a couple kick-ass volunteer coordinators, John Lebowski and Ethan Zuckerman, who, who works at the OSI, who were up at all hours uh, basically um, tell, telling uh, the, the volunteers what to do. And, uh, and, and we, we needed, of course, a, a web accessible CRM database to, to come in and, and, and house all the data they were collecting. So this little company called Salesforce said, well, we got one of those. Uh, and they, they had uh, five of their volunteer uh, uh, develop, well, a couple of people from their, their foundation and some people from their actual uh, development team who stepped forward and, and started working on this. Uh, and then I went to bed. That was what we accomplished kind of in the first day. I went to sleep, and when I woke up, we had a, a, uh, the first and to this day the only uh, XML schema for defining a, a missing person. It was called the People Finder Interchange Format, uh, and it's, uh, it's actually an, an RSS spec that Ping, Ping and, and Steve Wright and a, and a couple other guys from Salesforce worked on. It's actually in the process of getting standardized um, with the, the official international organizations. Um, and you can check it out if there's a URL at the bottom. Uh, and uh, we had amassed the data entry army. 
uh, over 3,000 volunteers took part in this effort. Uh, we processed over 100,000 records by hand. It's actually much more than that, but I, I don't have the exact number. That was in the first couple days, actually. Uh, and we, we, so we had two kind of simultaneous efforts doing, doing chunks of work. We had a, uh, the group of the, hand, the, the data entry volunteers who would just uh, go and read the message word posts and key them into a, data, uh, to a form. And then we had a team of, of technical volunteers who built scraping utilities to go scrape the structured data sources um, routinely and merge that data set back in. And so we ended up having uh, over 30 contributing engineers. So these people actually wrote code and, and took part in, in, in the effort directly. Uh, and they created, uh, uh, over the next week, over 10 different uh, applications from scratch that would scrape the data sources and created p generated libraries in, in basically every language uh, and uh, also helped create a front end for, for, for searching this, this, the data set. So here's a, a side story, um, which to me actually, well, I, I describe the side story as a, as a highlight of the last year of my life. Um, so we had, uh, in two days, had basically scraped all this data off, off, of the, off of these sites. And we had amassed literally 500 megabits of, of, uh, of, of data sets of, of survivor records. And we had them sitting around uh, waiting for Salesforce to get their uh, CRM front end uh, launched. Uh, they told us to be ready on Saturday night. Saturday night rolls around, still not up. Uh, they uh, said, well, we hope to get up Sunday. Sunday night comes around. Uh, they said it's closed, but it's not ready yet. Finally, on, on Monday afternoon, they, they, they launch it. But they tell us they can only uh, import two megabits of data at a time, which doesn't really work because we had 500 megabits of data. Uh, and, and also told me that their engineer who was working on this had to go home because he hadn't slept in a couple of days and that this probably wouldn't be solved anytime soon. Uh, and we had this guy, named, uh, one of my friends, Marty Kearns, who was on the phone with CNN, like waiting to give them the URL to put on the, t you know, we, we, and, and we only had like a fifth of the data in the searchable form that we had actually amassed. It was, it was, um, it was a disaster. <laughs> it was not good. Uh, and, uh, and I was just, uh, after I you know, got off the phone with, with, with Salesforce, I was pretty dejected and, and, uh, and, and looking through our wiki randomly and saw this post underneath. So we, we organized all the scraping uh, on the wiki. And so we had them split up into different sections, like uh, scraped or scraped and validated uh, data sets, or scraped and, and scraped validated and, and uh, uh, ready for uploading d data sets. And then one of our, one of our biggest data sets um, uh, listed on the wiki, I saw this note. Uh, this note that says, I'm uploading this right now. And the status is here, and it gave a link, A. Schmitz. Uh, and he also said, if anyone has a really fast line or is uh, next to the server, feel free to upload it yourself. Looks like it may take a while. Tell me if you upload it yourself, though, so I can stop the, uh, start, stop the process. So um, I email Andy Schmitz immediately and go, well, you know, the, the upload utility only takes two megabits of data at a time. What are you doing? This is, this is not, you know, not going to work. Um, and, and he said, yeah, I know. That's why I built this utility that chunks up all the data sets into two meg chunks and automatically uploads them, dedupes them as, as it goes, and automates the whole process. And I went, holy crap, Andy Schmitz, that's amazing. Uh, you know, are, are you going to work with all the other, you know, can you upload all the data sets today? And he said, yeah, sure. It'll, it'll all be done by the time I get home from school. I said, school? What college do you go to? And he said, high school. He was a 15-year-old kid in, as a, in a sophomore in high school. His name's Andy Schmitz. His uh, blog is lardbucket.org. I suggest you try to hire him immediately. Um, we tried. But he's uh, um, going to summer camp, so it didn't really work out. Uh, so in the end, we, can, we uh, amassed over 650,000 records, um, processed the, the, the web search form that we hosted, processed over a million searches in a week. Um, it was, uh, and the data was merged back with the, the Google People Finder search uh, uh, utility they had on the website. We also ended up sharing it with the Red Cross through the San Diego Supercomputing Center. And the Louisiana Commissioner's Office was, uh, had IBM uh, basically paid IBM to go do what we did, and they just sucked our data in. And, and called it done. Um, so, uh, well, first of all, you had questions on the on the story before I kind of go into into the, the civic space spiel. Um, go for it. I saw that some of your mailmen, the wiki mentioned uh, having an IRC uh, uh, chat as well. Do you find that useful in terms of just real time communications, or it was pretty useful, but to mo the majority of the communication was on the mailing list or directly emailing or IM uh, and phone. So we, had, we would have frequent scrums a couple times a day, at least, between the, the kind of key organizers. And then most of our day to day, most of the work was actually done by the volunteers. And the volunteers, most of their interaction was either direct, directly through email or through the mailing list. So was the scrums in some just IM group 
They were mostly conference calls, um, but some we had some IRC chat room chats, but not, not not too much. Although I I'm a big fan of IRC, I've done many many IRC meetings and they worked out great. It was a uh, kind of a generational thing, I think. Anything else? No. Okay. So backing up, who am I? Who you know? What do I do? Um, so uh, well, my name is Zach Rosen. I think you know that. Um, and. Uh, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, I'll give you the whole story. So a couple of years ago, I uh, was a student at the University of Illinois Computer Science Department. I was going to be a junior. Um, and uh, I was home for summer on, on break uh, at my house in Pittsburgh and uh, decided I really want to get involved in the, in the presidential campaign. This was the summer of 03 when things are just really starting to actually pick up. Uh, in uh, and I thought in the back of my mind about stuff I wanted to do. I mean, I, I was a geek, and I was uh, re really kind of interested in this, bl this blogging stuff, which was just like Six Apart had just got their first BC round. This stuff was just kind of starting to, to come alive, uh, for real, uh, at least in the public's eye. Uh, and I uh, you know, got kind of interested in this, um, this, this basically social science research. I uh, had added about 10 books to my Amazon uh, shopping cart like Linked and Emergence and uh, uh, Smart Mobs and you know, all, all those books. Uh, but I was a poor college student, so I couldn't afford them yet. Uh, but, and they were all auctions. They were all because I was cheap. And, uh, and I was, must have been really tired. And I, I clicked the wrong click and ordered them all. It was a big mistake, because I had $200 in my account. And I went actually $300 neg dollars negative. Uh, and, and got home from, and the next week I, was, I uh, drove home uh, to my house. Uh, uh, and uh, the books just started showing up, and I, and I kind of started reading them uh, uh, pretty quickly. Um, and uh, about that same time, uh, when I, I got into a few of them, uh, I heard about this guy named Howard Dean, uh, who was a presidential candidate. I heard about him before, but you know, heard he didn't have a shot in hell, uh, and so kind of wrote him off and, and didn't really think about it. But heard he was doing all this crazy, interesting stuff with uh, uh, the, the web and community organizing. And thought I'd check it out, and I ended up on, on his website, and, and uh, you know ended up on Meetup. And I you know I don't know if you've used Meetup, but you just type in your zip code, and it tells you go to this place at this time, and there'll be uh, a bunch of other people who want to work uh, uh, on the Dean campaign with you. Uh, and so I did that, and I ended up uh, in a in some random uh, a restaurant in Pittsburgh uh, with a bunch of other people uh, who who spent the next half an hour kind of looking at each other, wondering what to do. Because uh, no one was really in charge, and so we just kind of sat there looking at one another. Uh, I mean, has it, have any of you been to a, a real meetup? It's, uh, I've told this story a couple times, and everyone says, well, that, that sounds exactly right. So basically, you sit around the room, you look at one another for about half an hour, and then uh, someone stands up and says, well, we should do something. Let's talk about why we're here. And so you go around the room talking about why you're here, and before you know it, it's 9 p.m., it's time to go home and feed your kids. So everyone kind of leaves and disperses and says, well, that was fun. And then a month, month goes by, because meetups happen every month. And you show up again at the meetup, and half the people who were there before are gone, but they've been replaced by more people, and everyone's sitting in the room looking around and wondering what to do. Uh, and there's been no institutional uh, intelligence gathered or anything. Um, and so, uh, to me, I mean, this is ridiculous. Like, there's just no infrastructure here to support these groups to actually organize and do what we need to do. I mean, we're, we're trying to take over the country here, right? Win the, win the presidency. This is going to require a little bit more infrastructure. Uh, and so I, I was a geek and decided, well, why don't we start building some tools to actually um, help these communities organize. And so I set up a, a, a mailing list and a website. It was usually called Hack for Dean. It became known as, as Dean Space. Uh, and as a bunch of grassroots fall, and I, and I mailed the link to a bunch of um, independent kind of Dean campaign uh, communities, like Yahoo groups or these mailing lists or blogs, uh, basically saying, uh, OK, all you grassroots volunteers who know how to code, let's get together and build this stuff together. Uh, and within a week, 10 people had signed up, and we had a mailing list, and we started um, basically talking about what we wanted to do. Uh, and we decided that we were going to build an a open source um, uh, community organizing platform, basically. And, but, and more than that, we weren't just going to build our, our own set of tools. We were going to build an existing platform that was already out in the wild called Drupal. Uh, and we got together and, and started basically building uh, Drupal into the, the, the ultimate community organizing platform. Uh, uh, and that really meant that it. Uh, well, it was built to let people, let these local community groups uh, run a website, organize events, manage contacts, send emails, um, and, a, and a, you know, kind of a few other random things. Uh, some people were integrating with what are called voter file databases, which are basically databases of registered voters in, in their um, district. And people did some other things. Uh, but the twist was we wanted to build these community sites in such a way so that they could uh, interconnect. So you had literally thousands of different campaign communities. You had like Toledo for Dean, Pittsburgh for Dean, uh, Cincinnati for Dean, like every, every you know, 
uh, and, and not just geographic groups, but constituency groups, like Asian Americans for Dean, Doctors with Dean, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and each of these communities were trying to organ, you know, organize the campaign with inside their community context, really. But uh, they were all basically working towards the same thing. Uh, and it was really, really unfortunate, I thought, that um, none of the, the work and none of the collaboration that happened within inside these communities necessarily made it outside to the other communities who, were, who really were focusing on, on basically the exact same thing. And so we decided to build uh, tools that would let you share data seamlessly from one community to the other. So, uh, for example, it would let, uh, if you ran a Dean's Base site, it would let you subscribe to the national calendar of, of events within inside the whole campaign organization. It would just suck down your feed of, of event data and republish it on your site. And there was a simple distributed authentication and, and profile sharing mechanism. So on some Dean Space sites, you could use your account on the main Need for America website to log into your, to your, to your local Dean Space site and it would copy your profile information over. And then all content that we, 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 we pushed out of ha campaign headquarters came out on RSS. And any content published on a Dean Space site came out on RSS and you could actually import them and republish them on, on your site. Um, and uh, as, as volunteers, we basically just started setting up these sites everywhere. Um, and we had like 150 grassroots sites. Uh, and then um, I uh, decided to drop out of school and work on, at, move up to Burlington, Vermont, and work in campaign headquarters. I got to finagle my way into a job to, as a web developer. Uh, but I really wasn't a very good one, uh, and all the people up there were. Uh, but the way it worked was uh, we get you know, tasks. Like, we need to build this, or we need to solve this problem. And so all the other web developers on the team would just go and lock themselves in a room and and you know, wouldn't sleep until the, the thing was done. And I, I, I didn't sleep much either. But uh, because I wasn't a very good engineer, uh, I would go and ask all my friends in the Dean Space community, hey, <laughs> so we're trying to build this. <laughs> Who wants to help? Uh, and we, would, we, we actually got a lot done that way. Uh, and actually, the, all the state websites for the campaign were run on the Dean Space software, mostly built by grassroots volunteers. Uh, the main constituency site, uh, sites of the national organization, like the Asian Americans for Dean, Latinos for Dean, Doctors for Dean, all of those were, were Dean Space sites that were Again, built a lot by volunteers. Um, and, and then besides all the, the kind of local uh, uh, campaign websites. Basically, any time we, we, we had a problem where we, we couldn't afford an engineer to go build a solution, we would just throw a Dean Space site at, at it. Um, and, uh, and that was an interesting experience. But of course, as you know, you know came crashing down <laughs> pretty quickly. Uh, and uh, so um, oh, I missed the slide there. Um, Right. So uh, after the, the campaign ended, uh, I ended up in San Francisco. I was considering going back to school, applying to Stanford or something. Uh, but had the good fortune to run into, uh, well, meet with the, uh, a uh, Silicon Valley venture capitalist named Andy Rappaport, who was basically running a social incubator um, that would uh, incubate social projects. Uh, and I pitched him on, well, so we had this you know, pretty awesome project in the, in the knee campaign. It was a real shame if we lose all this work that we'd started doing. And furthermore, um, if we don't do this work, if we don't get an open source platform that can support these kind of communities, the existing market of vendor and services would never meet, I don't think I would ever meet the needs of, of these campaign communities. Uh, I mean, really, uh, on one end of the spectrum, right, you have, you have the, the, the um, big uh, web app service providers like Microsoft, MSN, and, and Google, and Yahoo, um, who uh, had interesting tools to, to grassroots organizers like Yahoo Groups, or Google Groups, or, or MSN Groups. But really, the, the kind of uh, web application needs of an organization are go well beyond mailing lists and, and simple blocks. They need, they need tools for actually organizing events. They need CRM databases for managing, managing contacts. They need event organizing tools like Evite. And they want them all integrated and seamlessly uh, interlocking. And they want to be able to um, uh, provide a seamless user interface and experience for their constituents. Right? It's, not, it's not good enough to have all these different tools with all these different logins kind of stitched together in HTML. Um, and on the other end of the spectrum, you probably don't know any of these companies, but there's these big providers called uh, the big, big three are Katera, GetActive, and Kaveo. Uh, and they're basically analogous to um, the ERP or CRM market in the, in the business world. So they build uh, proprietary full stack solutions for basically they say, uh, we'll stick your whole, whole organization more or less into our web application stack uh, and then support it. Um, and so they, they do, you know, uh, uh, do CRM databases that manage millions of contacts, send blast emails for 10 million uh, contacts in an hour, and um, uh, do CMS and, and event organizing and all these tools. But the, the cost of these, these, these platforms are really expensive. It's very prohibitive. prohibitive. It's hard enough for actually a, a sizable national organization with a decent budget to afford, let alone a small organization, let alone a grassroots group that just came together in, in a meetup room. 
Uh, and so our, I mean, my pitch was, we're going to build this stuff. We're going to build it free, uh, well, as, as open source. And you know, there'll, be, there'll be a business support uh, structure around it. But we want to we try to um, basically make this a race to the bottom, and we're going we're to strap on lead boots. Uh, and he, uh, Andy Rappaport agreed to fund us. And we, um, the, the name of the project uh, turned into Civic Space instead of Dean Space, because the campaign's obviously over. over. Um, and we just started uh, building the, the application stack. Again, because it turns out any code written in a campaign cycle probably isn't worth keeping, um, and so uh, we we've built uh, we, we've been building uh, the civic space Drupal distribution, and at this point it has we basically have the whole stack. It does it does uh, uh, it has a full blown CRM system that we've integrated. It has uh, really good event organizing tools, group forming tools. It's a it's built on Drupal, and Drupal is a really awesome uh, content management system. Uh, and you know uh, the the bullet kind of feature list for this thing is is really extensive um, at this point. And we have 2,000 organizations who are up and running with our distribution of of of, uh, of Drupal. Many other organizations also run Drupal and use some of the modules that we've developed because because our distribution is completely unforked from from the Drupal distribution. Uh, and there's 30 vendor firms who employ over 150 people at this point who make a living servicing the stack technology. And at this point, we can uh, we're reaching some of the biggest organizations out there, like uh, American Cancer Society or uh, uh, SCIU and um, uh, uh, Planned Parenthood. A lot of the big guys are, are getting on this because it's, it's better and cheaper. Uh, but also, you know, majority of the organizations using this stuff are very small, uh, and just as some guy who you know is setting this thing up as pro bono for some grassroots group he cares about, or or she. Um, so I'm going to show you a little bit about you know here's, here's a screen of, of one of the, the organizations that use Civic Spaces, Music of America. They're one of the earliest users. They uh, are also uh, incubated by Skyline Public Works, so we had a, we had an in with these guys. Um, but um, so here's a front page on their website. Uh, and it's kind of like a news-oriented website. Uh, but if you click the events uh, page, this is just one example of how kind of civic space works. You get a map of the United States, and, and if you uh, click a state like uh, California, here's all a listing of all the events that Music for America uh, has a presence at in California. So Music for America is a, is a, is a, a politics and, and music uh, grassroots organization. Uh, and their uh, model is basically they send their their uh, literature and swag and and uh, voter registration forms and all that along with the bands uh, across the country uh, that they work with. Um, and so if you go and and you want to see a free show, you just go and, and click on your state and choose a concert. And um, and here it shows the detail of the concert. And if you click volunteer, you fill out this form with your name, your email address, your cell phone number, all that, and press submit. Uh, oops, I uh, well, ignore that. You should be press submit, and uh, within a half an hour, a volunteer organizer at Music for America calls you up on the phone and says, "Show up at this concert. Uh, uh, go in the back door. Say your name is Susie, and that you're you're from Music for America. They'll let you in for free. You get your your um, uh, 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 voter your your voter registration forms and the, and the Music for America literature, and you set up a booth in the back, and they have all the material for the booth, and uh, and then you register for people to vote, and you you pass out the, the literature, you get people to sign up on the Music for America mailing list, and then when you're done at the night at the end of the night, you go in and put all that stuff in an envelope and mail it back to Music for America headquarters, and so like this, they're able to organize it over uh, uh, many nights these days. It's it's over five uh, concerts across the country, and the and the. The election season last year, they're doing up to 15 to 20 uh, per night with only a few volunteers, because the volunteers just answer questions. right? They don't have to be present at these events. And so in a very virtual way, they'll be able to reach out very extensively and have a showing in a lot of different places. So, uh, And that's just one example of, 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 of how an organization uses civic space. There's lots I can get into. And if we have some time, I'll, I can show you some other sites. Um, so this is what we're up to. We're actually splitting the project into two different entities at this point, a nonprofit and a for-profit. Uh, I'm heading up the nonprofit, um, and well, the, so the for-profit is going to launch a low-cost ASP, so literally a thirty or forty dollars a month service that you can sign up and, and get your civic space site out and, and get it, and it'll be supported and, and updated. Um, and if there's a problem, you can call someone; they'll, they'll help you work through your issue. Uh, and uh, and that the, the for-profit is going to be purely uh, focused on, on just getting an ASP off the ground and, and making it work. And the nonprofit, we're going to be focused on our, our community. We have a pretty extensive community of, of, of organizations that we already work with, um, organizations we're, we're currently talking to. 
um, or, or uh, users who just show up on our mailing list or, or developers and, and, and vendors who participate setting up sites and, and developing tools. Um, and so we're, gonna, we, we're basically the, the public face of that community uh, and also kind of the traffic hop. We point people, uh, if, if an organization wants to get at the tools, wants to be supported, we'll hook them up with a, a vendor if they need that or if they have a tech team in-house, we'll, we'll get the tech team up to speed. Um, and, uh, and we're also going to uh, uh, do some trainings and workshops and retreats um, and try to uh, uh, get some, try to narrow in on kind of the best practices of, of community organizing because in a lot of ways it's kind of a, 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 new, a new practice and a new, and a new field. And we really, we really want to see what works and what doesn't work and try to um, learn um, from, from people within our community. Sure. Was the uh, for-profit component part of uh, Andy Rappaport's you know, or original thought in funding this, or did that yeah. just, yeah. We, we original, I mean, the original, uh, yeah, when, when we first started talking about this, yeah, it was, it was bullet point number two, probably. Um, it's taken us a while to get there, because it's, um, uh, it's, it's a hard market to serve, uh, and it's a lot of technology to, 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 to support. Um, so a lot of organizations are, I mean, basically being served by ASPs, but they just cost a lot of money because you get high touch service. You, you hire a vendor and they set up the software and they, they support it. Uh, and to get to the low, the low, uh, the, the massively scalable, low cost ASP, it's just taken us a while to build out the, the actual platform code. Uh, we, we could have launched it a while ago, but it, it, it's been, a, it would have been an incomplete pl product. And I wouldn't want to try to be, be building out the, the platform while trying to scale up an ASP at the same time. Um, but at this point, the product is basically, it's, it's there. We, we've hit all our feature points, and so it's, it's, it's about time to, to get a, an ASP set up. But it's all open source, so anyone can come in, and, and we'd hope, actually, that people, you know, maybe choose a different market vertical, but whatever, you know, launch their own ASP for, and specialize it in, in their own way. The more, the merrier. This is a social project and at the end of the day. It's not a, a, a money-seeking business. Um, the other question is, uh, what are the internationalization and globalization features of Drupal and the yeah, framework? Focused or sure. Well, it's actually, Drupal has its roots in Belgium. It's a, it's a very much an international project and is fully uh, internationalizable. Um, and so you can localize it to one single language. But actually, there's, there's uh, as a contributor module, you can actually uh, uh, translate into multiple languages at once. Uh, and it's translated currently into over 30 or 40 languages. And some are incomplete, some are fully complete. Um, and uh, the civic space distribution still needs some work to, to inter I mean, uh, just with the, the Drupal core translation, you'll get a lot. But some of the translations definitely need some work. So in the coming year or two, I think we're going we're gonna to put more resources into it. But for right now, we're, we're, we are just focused on the US. OK. Any other questions? I can, uh, if you want, I can show some other sites so we can we can dig into. I can show you some demos of stuff that we're that we're working on, uh, depending on time or, or what you guys want to do. You know, at, at a higher level, um, what do you think the key learnings are about mixing? You know, I think that the question that everybody re wrestles with in using technology to help with collective action is how do we use the places where technology scales well to do those things effectively and combine it with the on-the-ground, in-person connections and, and actions, which wind up being incredibly important. Right. So thoughts about that? Well, um, I mean, you know, technology is it's just a tool. It just helps you facilitate um, work that you, that you want to do. Uh, and uh, one of the biggest uh, hang-ups in, in my mind are, are people who, who, in organizations that are working for campaigns, who start to think of online organizing or these, these new tools as kind of like, oh, the, the internet thing or the internet people in a corner who, do the, who write the emails and, and, and do everything virtually. When, in fact, people who have been successful uh, using these tools have recognized that really it's just a facilitator for, for uh, you know, uh, uh, on the streets, offline action and, and, and com direct communication between their, their constituents. Um, and uh, and so you know, it's all about how you think about how to how to how to roll out these tools and what they're what they're going to support. But um, uh, I personally try to keep the focus on you know how, how does this help my organization uh, reach the people that they need to reach and be effective in organizing their their constituents. Um, and I think the the internet and 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 these web tools 
give an ama- I mean, give an amazing amount of leverage potentially to, to organizations to do that if if they can um, uh, get over the 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 kind of you know the cost of the application and the the, the jump to the, you know get, be able to get up and running inside the organization and know how to use it effectively and have a plan for how to use it effectively. So those are the barriers at the moment. It's it's literally the the tools are hard to access, uh, which we're we're fixing and have, a lot of cases have fixed. And once you have the tools in place, it's not very clear how you employ them to the, uh, to the best benefit of what you're trying to do. And so in the next year, that's really going to be our focus: is really kind of you know doing the community organizing practice 101 manual that we can give out to people and and uh, and work work on. Anything else? No? You don't have to be the only person. Right, I mean, it's like a believer in anybody else. Sure. Well, I can give you some demos of, of some stuff if, if we have a bit of time. Sure. Cool. How many of you actually um, worked in a grassroots organization or, or have volunteered for one? Or, I mean, I, I'm okay, cool. So um, uh, you know, there are things that I think are personally very interesting, but but are um, you know the things that actually are very interesting in a lot of ways to grassroots organizers are the things that I think are, are boring, like a CRM database, like a database to manage your contacts. Um, let's see if this loads. So I'll show you. I'll, I'll just kind of give you a world one, I guess. So we actually integrated a, uh, a, a CRM system called uh, called Civis CRM, uh, which was uh, recently created um, in the last six months. Actually, well, it's been in works for for a couple of years, but only now is really available. So it's uh, much like uh, Salesforce or um, Siebel or uh, Sugar CRM are to the business industry, right? The, the database to manage uh, uh, data about your customers. Uh, Civic CRM is, is is to a grassroots organization. It's data to manage. It's a database to manage data about your your constituents. Um, and so right now the integration is not. Um, uh, it, well, it's 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 pretty. I mean, it's it, it's working and it, it's it's there. But uh, we want to um, kind of drop it down another another layer uh, or, or two in, in the platform. But um, so if you oh, there we go. This is just a sandbox that they have running with a bunch of dummy contact data, and that's why I'm using it. Um, so basically, here it just uh, gives you a listing of all all the the people that you know about in, in your organization, and you can map uh, users, or uh, you can map uh, households, you can map uh, organizations, um, and we can go see a, a contact record here. Um, So here's a, a view of a contact record. Uh, this person's name is uh, Apuvi V. Adams, Sr. Uh, and you, you can see there, you know, it, it does the basic demographic information, uh, address information, contact information, all that kind of stuff. Um, but uh, you can, uh, if they've contributed, there's a tab where you can see their, their contributions. Um, uh, we, we can log their activities, like if they, if they organize an event or if they attended an event or if they've, um, in the future we want to we do things like if they actually organize a discussion group in, inside a community. Um, we can map relationships between, between contacts, like if, there's, if we know someone's a, a daughter of, of, a, of a person or, or a husband or wife, we can do that. Uh, and, and organizers can leave notes about 
about contacts. And basically, it's just a database to collect information about who their constituents are. And then they can go in here and do, do fancy searches that, that, um, uh, to send mailings, to, to raise money, or also you know, to, to, or, to, to find people who want to organize around uh, a, a certain issue or have the certain skill set that they're, that they're going to need. Um, so let me uh, show you actually one that's actually running um, live. Uh, this is a total sandbox, so ignore the URL and, uh, and the nasty looking design. This is something I've just been um, hacking on uh, recently because we built a, a whole bunch of new tools uh, that let people um, basically form groups within their site uh, and and uh, organize in these groups in, the, in, in their site. And I've uh, been wanting to play with it, so I set up the site to, to um, uh, for a few of uh, my friends to go and, and mess around with them. Uh, so basically, anyone who goes and uh, uh, signs up on the site gets joined to the main group on the site, which is called LC Main at the moment. Um, and each group um, has a wiki page that gets automatically created that anyone can go in and edit. Uh, and you know, like any wiki, you can use a wiki markup, and, and these, these uh, asterisks get turned into bullet points. Uh, and you can create a new wiki page with, with wiki words. You just put the wiki words in and click it, and create a new page. Or you can just go and click this link, and you can create a new wiki page. But uh, each group also gets a, a uh, message form, uh, and it looks like just a, like a, you know any normal message form. You can go in and uh, see a message form and add a comment. But the interesting thing here is uh, these message forms are actually backed by a mailing list. It's a it's a two way mailing list message form integration, like a Yahoo group or like a Google group. So any message posted here gets sent out to everyone who's a member of the group on on a mail, and you can reply to any message on the, on the mail and it get posted as a comment uh, on on the thread. So uh, if I had my, my computer here, I could show you the, the, the mail threads in my mailbox. But you can see, here's what it looks like on the actual um, uh, message. And you can see, we're still messing with some of the, the message formatting. You'll see this came off a mail client and added some extra line breaks that we need to filter out. But uh, it just lets you have, have a, th a threaded discussion that people can interact with in their own way. I mean, Yahoo Group, Yahoo Group says Yahoo is basically number one community property in a lot of ways. It has 50 million registered users uh, and, and is a huge in funnel uh, to, to get new users into their system. And the reason I think it works, it's been so successful, is um, because it lets people um, collaborate in groups in the way that they want to. Some people like to do it through a message form, through a website. Some people like just a mailing list. And with the Yahoo group, you can do both. And people can interact in the way that they're most comfortable with. And they don't have to know about what each other is, is, is doing. It just works. Um, and so we've, we've really strived to, to implement the same, the same layer of functionality in, into, into this system. Uh, and then there's a membership pa panel, which tells you all the members of a group. Uh, and groups can have subgroups. So the subgroup of this main group is a web developer group, which is for people who are, doing, who are building uh, out this website. Uh, and, uh, but anyone can come in and actually create their own group, give it a name, give a description, give it a purpose, um, any of moderation controls, invite, close, you know, whatnot. Give it a mail address uh, for the mailing list. That, that's the mail, the mail address that, that mails will be sent out as. Um, and then all groups that are created are shown up in the, in the groups listing. Uh, and people can just go and click on a group. And all the, all the groups you belong to are listed down here. Uh, and that's it's pretty simple at the moment, but you know we can we can eat, we're, we have and and I could on this site build out uh, integration of event information or or um, uh, uh, social network you know better social networking, networking tools and really this becomes a a way to um, break your community into small working groups that can seamlessly collaborate, but also in the context of your site, right? So one of the, one of the biggest so it turns out that there were more people who created Yahoo groups in the Dean campaign who are members of those Yahoo groups then we're actually in the main uh, campaign mailing list, um, which is pretty interesting if you think about it. So there's more people actually out there independently organizing on their own mailing list than we're on the main mailing list run by the campaign. But the, 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 the problem was, if you create one mailing list, like if you, if you were Cincinnati for Dean, and you made a general mailing list for just general announcements, if you got more than 100 people on there, it just you have to moderate because people just 
be sending random crap and you can't deal with it. Well, that doesn't work if, if, if inside the group in Cincinnati, you need to have like a, a group of people who are focused on event organizing. They need to talk to each other whenever they want. Uh, and so what will happen is they'll go and create another Yahoo group for just event organizing. But it's a different Yahoo group completely and has no context or connection between the groups. And so pretty soon after you create three or four groups, it just gets so confusing it just breaks down. What this allows you to do is do that all within your community website. Um, and have the groups related to each other through the hierarchies. Uh, and we're going to build rules into here, like if you create a, a subgroup of a group, it'll send a, a, the main group a, a message and, and do things with the, inter, the, the uh, information architecture to make it really easy to see how the groups relate to one another. Um, so, um, yeah, and, and uh, in the future, well, actually it works now, but it's not implemented on the site. This is uh, integrated in the CRM database. And so all the, all, all the group memberships that people do on the front end get mapped to the back end. And so people can do searches like, show me everyone who, who is in the group for event organizing and fundraising. And then send them all an email or, or, you know, or, 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 or whatever, or, give, or export the CSV. Um, and here's a little demo of, of uh, one of the, the uh, kind of forward-facing things that we can do with the CRM database. So here's a people um, searching um, bar. So it basically lets you search on the, the, the uh, uh, profile information of people who registered on the site. I, I force people to fill out a pretty extensive form to, to join the site at the moment. So we can go in here and say, uh, give me everyone who's in New York uh, who's good at uh, Drupal development. And we go and get a list. And pretty soon you'll be able to email all these people or, or you know, get, get the CSV. Um, and has their, their profile information, their contact information, and all that, all that kind of stuff. So what, what, this, what people do basically is, is um, really uh, directly facilitate the day-to-day, -day, we hope, the day-to-day -day kind of nitty-gritty work they do in, in community organizing. Uh, and have it all web archival, you know, all, all up on the web, all uh, uh, transparent to anyone who, who participates in, inside the community. So think, you, if, you, if you do a meeting in real life, you take notes on the wiki, and then people who couldn't make it to the meeting can read those notes on the wiki and send a, a follow-up message to the mailing list when, when you're done. Uh, and, and everything that happens within, within inside the campaign community can get, can get uh, recorded in the, in, in the database if, if, if you need it. And as, as organizations kind of grow from small grassroots groups that are just independent or organizing to something that needs, well, they need to have more of a kind of public facing uh, website, they can start unlocking the tools um, that are, exist inside civic space, like the, the kind of forward facing CMS tools, and build a, you know, build a really solid template that looks great. Or um, uh, you know, make, instead of having all the, the, the content be private, start making it public and, and advertise it on your website. So any, any questions? Uh, I'd be interested in hearing if you've been given any thought to um, the proliferation of mobile devices. Is there anything that's now specific to the mobile devices? Is it just repurposing this content? Um, sure. New opportunities? Sure. I, I, yeah, I mean, absolutely. And in fact, uh, I, I think uh, ever since Smart Bobs got published, every, every um, uh, bleeding edge campaign organizer has been trying to figure out how to leverage SMS. I mean, there's lots of really interesting stories, like, you know, I don't, you, you know what's about the, the, like the South Korean election of, of President Roe. Uh, there's many interesting stories in that alone, but basically it was it said that that the you know he won by maybe one percent, and that tipping point um, could be could be measured in the the last minute that that difference was made up in in, in the last uh, minute SMS campaign initiated on the Oh My News website. That, that uh, independent activists um, uh, did on a basically a person by person basis. Basically, someone posted a forum saying, "Everyone, go and SMS everyone in your phone and tell them to get out to vote, uh, and and tell people everyone else to do the same." And they actually recorded the the, the SMS sent out on the gateways, and it was like staggering uh, how many how many messages were sent out. The other interesting story is that is that the Chinese uh, uh, SMS campaign around the um, uh, SARS. So the government was locking down a lot of the, gov the, the, the information um, uh, that was getting out about, about um, uh, how bad the, the SARS epidemic really was. So all, all the government-controlled news agencies were saying, oh, this isn't a big deal, we got this under control, you know, we got doctors all putting it on the TVs, you know, don't worry. Um, and uh, basically people uh, living in China uh, got freaked, some of them got freaked out and started SMSing all the friends saying uh, and, and uh, about the the, the um, SARS um, 
uh, uh, bug and um, I mean, a lot of rumors got started, but they actually measured how, how many they, they measured how many times a character that, that represented SARS was sent out on the carriers. It was 17 million messages in a few days, uh, and actually they accredit that that kind of the grassroots as a message campaign to what happened a few days later when the government actually came out and publicly said that they misrepresented things. And that was the first time the, the government, the Chinese government, had actually done an about face like that ever, really. Um, and that was only because they had no control over the situation because people were independently um, taking upon themselves to, to, spread, to spread the messages. And so every, everyone has been trying to figure out how to leverage this stuff. The problem, though, is um, those, in those two examples, those were independent organizers on a, on a person by person basis, basically doing it themselves, right? Just SMSing everyone in their address book. Um, so that means two things for campaign organizers. One is, um, uh, if you if you want to start something like that, right, you basically have to get your, your independent constituents to take it upon themselves to SMS everyone in their personal address book. Just sending a blast SMS from the campaign headquarters is only it isn't going to be necessarily viral, right? It's just going to reach people that you already know. If you want to get beyond that and, and start something that, just, that 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 picks up speed and, and rolls beyond your 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 constituent base, you have to get your independent organizers to take to to, to own it really. But the other thing is a, is a problem is if you try to send more than you know 100 SMS messages, carriers um, aren't going to put up with it. And the, the American carriers um, uh, for text messaging, um, uh, I mean, the, the, a lot of things are just straight up flaky. But uh, they also uh, lock down a lot of things. And you have to have agreements with, with the carriers to basically send, send many messages at once. And, and political campaigns have yet to really get that infrastructure in place at the moment. They're working on it. I know some people who are doing some projects that supposedly have, have the carrier hookup, but, but to my knowledge, it hasn't really been used um, uh, yet, successfully at least. But the other thing is that we don't have the culture for SMS in a lot of ways. We're developing it. In the last years, actually, it's grown tremendously. But um, uh, literally, everyone in South Korea and in Europe and a lot of all these countries, like, it's, it's day to day. It's what they do. Like they, that, that's how they communicate as as a society. And it's only been recently that that they actually blame it on Amer the marketing departments of, of our uh, cell phone carriers in America, basically saying, "Oh, who would ever want to text message this call? There's no point." And in Europe, uh, SMS text messaging took off because the, the the cell phone providers were state owned, and the pricing structures were such that calls cost way more than a text message. And so people, as a as a financial um, uh, for financial reasons, started text messaging one, one another and established the culture that way. In America, that's not the case. Text messaging is, is no less or no more, basically, than, than, than calling. So there's no economic uh, incentive for, to do it. Um, and, the market, and, and you know, basically any provider uh, allows for text messaging, but the marketing departments don't push it until recently when, when it just started happening. So that's changed a lot in the last year. There's been a lot more kind of awareness of text messaging. There's a lot of text messaging in general. Um, and I think there's a lot that we can do to start to harness it. Um, and I have a couple ideas. But yeah. Any questions for us? Uh, well, what, do you, I mean, what, what are your thoughts on, on this kind of stuff? I mean, is this, how, how relevant do you see this to research that you, you guys already, already do? Uh, pretty relevant. I mean, uh, we are not necessarily in the business of political activism, right. but we are in the business of activism, uh, at least enterprise activism. And the difference between getting a group of people to pull together for a political campaign and uh, the difference between doing that and a marketing campaign is only enormous, but not totally vast. So uh, there is a lot of relevance here. Um, I mean, from our group's work, and we can talk about this over lunch, and there's some people in the room that we can all go to lunch, but um, we, we are focused uh, pretty intensively on that core feature of the threaded conversation. Mm -hmm. And the sense I get is that uh, most sites implement threaded conversation same as it ever was, and that uh, a lot of our work is what can you do to augment the thread through histories of authors, histories of threads, and the histories of the discussion environments. So uh, a a as you did with the Katrina People Finder, adding some metadata to those conversations and structuring them in some ways adds enormous value to them. So that, that's really one of the main thrusts for us. Uh, so we should definitely talk about you know, how are the ways that we could actually augment the thread. Right? You have an enormous constellation of services around that thread. Uh, we've been very much focused on that thread. Right. So, uh, I mean, you know, I, I make a living building web apps for community organizing. 
Most of my day-to-day -day work is done through mailing lists. Mailing lists haven't changed in 20 years. I mean, it's the same damn thing. Uh, and I think um, that's, that's an area that, that's going to, I mean, I, the group stuff, I think, is, is our step towards that. But I think, in general, um, uh, collaboration, uh, horizontal collaboration um, uh, uh, tools um, ha are um, antiquated in a lot of ways. And what they're missing is, I mean, the, the kind of leap from mailing lists to the web hasn't happened the way it should, I think, um, uh, in a lot of ways. Uh, and I, you know, we can dig into that a little bit. But I think um, uh, uh, the trick is you can't, you, you, have to, you have to do it seamlessly. You have to, you have to let people, in, in order to get someone to pay attention to what you're doing, it has to show up in the, the email box, right? Even the, the, the person who subscribes to all, you know, I subscribe to a 500 RSS feeds. I don't pay attention to something unless it's in my email box. That's just straight up. Uh, and, uh, but a lot of, uh, you know, just email to email collaboration is pretty, you know, has its limits, right? Its limit is, you know, collaborating around a, a Word document, right? That gets tough. And, and there are solutions for this on the web, like right? wikis. But um, uh, at the end of the day, you still need to get people uh, uh, to pay attention to, to, to your thread. And so that leap from email to, to web, I think, is need, can need some help. Um, and we're, we're definitely hacking on it, so. Okay. Well, with that, um, thank you. Mm -hmm. That was very informative. I think there's a lot of relevance here. Cool. So thanks so much. No